Good morning or afternoon as the case may be, and thank you for joining us for the final Crown Seminar of 2021. My name is David Siddharth Patel. I'm a senior fellow at the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. And today we have a really exciting panel discussion for you on reassessing the impacts of the Iranian revolution elsewhere uh, with uh, Laurence Loire, Raphael Lefebvre, and Simon Wolfgang Fux, and Mohammed Atai, a fellow at the Crown Center as discussant. This is a particularly exciting panel because we have scholars who we normally aren't able to bring to you at the Crown Center. We have four, all three of the scholars are based in Europe and Mohammed is, is based down the hall. Uh, and what's great is all of these scholars have done really cutting edge foundational work on the Iranian revolution's impacts throughout the Muslim world, uh, either recently or in the past. And so getting them in conversation with one another is a, is a, is a, is a fantastic opportunity. We're gonna, I'm not going to go into their bios. I'll provide links on in the chat. We're going to go from 11 to 12.30, and, and here's the schedule for the day. I'm going to turn it over to Mohammed in a few minutes just to offer a few words to frame the topic and, and put the panel in, in some sort of historiographical context. And then each of the panelists will speak for 10 to 15 minutes. Mohammed will then offer five to seven minutes as, of discussion, and that should leave plenty of time for question and answer. Uh, I ask you to ask your questions uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If you don't see it, hover your cursor over the bottom and it should pop up. The chat will be open, but panelists will not be monitoring the chat. The Crown Center staff will. But again, if you have questions for the panelists, uh, please ask them uh, via the Q&A button. Closed captioning is available and the session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Crown Center's very exciting YouTube page in the near future. So without further ado, let me go ahead and turn it over to Mohammed, please. Thank you so much, David. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to join this panel with uh, the scholars whose uh, research has brought uh, valuable insight into our understanding of the Iranian revolution and transnational Islamic movements. Uh, so uh, in recent years, uh, important scholarly works have been produced to shed a new light on the making of the Iranian revolution and its international or global ramifications. Uh, these works have uh, reconsidered the historiography, the standard periodization, and they have relied on, the, on a range of newly available uh, archives, uh, memoirs, um, and oral history interviews to write new histories of the revolution. However, there are noticeable gaps in the historiography that makes uh, this panel's conversation even more interesting and timely concerning the direction of the scholarship on, uh, on the international impact of the revolution. Uh, so in talking about the uh, international or global impact of the revolution, we cannot ignore the importance of the circulation of uh, ideas and people in the context of the global 1960s and 1970s and how uh, those ideas uh, and uh, like transnational people and activists in, the, in, in these two decades influenced uh, uh, the anti-Shah opposition and uh, the subsequent internationalization of the revolution. Uh, despite some uh, interesting works on the subject, I think there is a great need to uh, work and to, to write uh, on how these uh, transnational ideas and uh, people in the context of the global 1960s and 70s influenced the clerical network around Ayatollah Khomeini, who was uh, residing in Najaf uh, um, um, when he was in exile. And, uh, uh, this is especially important because uh, this network, this transnational network, came to play an important role in the initial efforts to export the revolution after 1979. Uh, another shortcoming in the scholarship is, um, is ignoring or downplaying the impact of the revolution on Sunni movements in the dominant historiography 
the historiography uh, has tended to focus on the impact of the revolution on uh, Shia movements, Shia communities outside Iran. So before the revolution, the, the Shia scholarship was accused of being Iran-centric. Uh, and ironically, the clerical-led revolution in 1979 generated great uh, uh, scholarly attention to Shia communities outside Iran, in Lebanon, in the Persian Gulf, and elsewhere. Uh, however, um, uh, it seems that the scholarship, uh, generally speaking, is really focused on the impact of the revolution on the Shia communities and is uh, somehow dismissive of the important interaction between revolutionary Iranians and, uh, and uh, Sunni movements, Sunni clerics uh, outside Iran, for example, uh, in terms of the Iranian uh, interaction with the Muslim Brotherhood after 1979, or the important uh, ecumenical cooperation between Sunni and Shia ulama in Lebanon that was partly inspired by the ideas and example of the revolution in Iran in 1979. Uh, and my final point about the gap is in the scholarship is about uh, the uh, uh, the activities of the uh, pro Khomeini clerics and activists after 1979 to export the revolution through transnational clerical networks and through the IRGC. So we know that uh, a number of interesting works had been produced about uh, the formation of the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, and the internationalization of the, the, the this organization. However, I think uh, uh, there is, um, we still need a detailed narrative about how uh, the pro Khomeini activists and clerics uh, use the IRGC um, and, and their like, transnational connections to a spread the revolution after 1979. Uh, so uh, uh, the IRGC officially began to uh, take the responsibility to back the liberation movements and export the revolution in 1980 when uh, uh, the unit of the Islamic liberation movements was established inside the IRGC. And uh, that unit relied initially on the transnational networks that the anti-Shah opposition had established in the 1970s uh, uh, in connection with uh, activists from Palestine to Eritrea to the Philippines and Thailand, and uh, also in uh, collaboration with uh, transnational Islamic movements that uh, the, the scholars on this panel have studied in the context of Lebanon and the Persian Gulf and Iraq and Pakistan. Uh, thank you, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Mohammed. So kicking us off, uh, Laurence. Yes, thank you. So just let me share my PowerPoint. Okay, um, just a few moments. Okay, yeah. So thank you uh, for being here. Uh, so I will um, focus my um, my presentation as the title uh, shows on what I call the Iraqi brokers of the Iranian revolution in the Persian Gulf. And uh, I will make a few comments on the role of these Iraqi brokers in the wider uh, Arab world. Um, so as an introduction, I would like to tell you how I began uh, uh, my research, it was, I mean, in 2002, so almost 20, 20 years ago, I was a, a young postdoc uh, uh, fellow researcher and I had uh, done my PhD on, on something completely different uh, uh, on the Palestinian minority in Israel. And so uh, uh, when I decided to turn to the Gulf, my idea was still to work on minority issues. And uh, so I just 
picked up the Shia issue because nothing had been written on the topic. And uh, I also uh, 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 was very interested in the issue because I had read a lot and written a few uh, student papers on uh, uh, Shias in, in Lebanon. Um, so my first field work was in, um, was in Bahrain in August 2002. Uh, I knew, I mean, quasi nothing about the Gulf. Uh, I knew a little bit about, about Shiism. Uh, very few papers, I mean, academic stuff had been written on Shias in the Gulf, on even less on Shia Islamic movements in the Gulf. A few chapters in some books uh, uh, explaining basically uh, with this uh, Iranian-centric perspective that that will all I guess will try to like to debunk uh, today uh, that uh, uh, somehow the movements that uh, uh, unfolded uh, the, the opposition movements that uh, uh, unfolded in uh, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia for example uh, after the Iranian revolution were all driven uh, a remote control directly from Tehran that these Shia Islamic movements uh, in Bahrain Saudi Arabia and Kuwait were all Iranian created, uh, 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 and uh, this is what I thought. And so one of the first uh, uh, material and the kind of material that I was given when I uh, uh, began my fieldwork in Bahrain was this uh, picture uh, uh, that you see. Uh, uh, so clerics, uh, uh, um, this uh, typically was uh, stamped, uh, you know, in, in houses or, or Husseiniyas or, or whatever. Uh, so you see on the, on the left, uh, Sayyid Mohammed Shirazi, who died in, in 2001, uh, uh, his nephew, Mohammed uh, Taqi al-Mudarisi, and his brother, Sayyid Sadiq al-Shirazi, uh, on, the, on the right. So uh, uh, I didn't know about these people. I had read nothing about these people and nothing had been written at the time. I mean, in English, in French, and even, I mean, if you would dig in like Arabic sources, I don't read Persian, but uh, I, I, I mean, I know uh, Arabic. Uh, so these people were pretty uh, unknown. And so when I came back to France, I tried to dig in the uh, academic literature uh, to, to try to, to, to see whether these people were known and who they were. So they were called like Shirazi Mudarisi. It sounds very Iranian. So my first like Nija reflex was really to look at books on Iranian history, the Iranian revolution, but I found nothing. Uh, of course, I found mentions of people named Shirazi, but, but they were not the guy I was interested in. And this is only when I, I, I just uh, read a book from a French historian, uh, uh, Pierre-Jean Guizard, uh, uh, a history, a short history of Iraq that the Mudarisi brothers were mentioned very briefly. And so that I began to uh, uh, understand that I needed to look at Iraq. If I wanted to understand something about uh, Shia uh, Islamic movements uh, in the Gulf. So, so yes, these people, uh, they have Iranian names. Uh, uh, and they have an Iranian background, but uh, 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 their forefathers uh, have been born in uh, in Iran, but they are all born in uh, in Iraq. Uh, Mohammed Shirazi himself, he was born in Najaf. And so uh, 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 it seems uh, that uh, uh, Mohammed Shirazi himself had uh, uh, the, the Iranian nationality, but the Mudarisi brothers were Iraqi by, by citizenship. And so uh, uh, um, from then, I, I, you know, I, I began to investigate more in depth uh, the relationship between between Iraq and between these uh, um, movements that I was uh, trying to uh, understand in um, in Bahrain and, and in the Gulf monarchies. So this group uh, was was labeled uh, by by people who were talking to me like the Shirazian or the Kabbala group because. Uh, uh, um, um, they were based uh, uh, in the, until the 80s after they all moved after the revolution. And even before the revolution and in the 70s, they, they've been expelled from Iraq and they first moved to go to Kuwait. Uh, and then after the, uh, the revolution in Iran, they moved to, to Iran, but they were from Kabbalah uh, and very representative, I would say, of uh, um, uh, the, the Persian communities in Kabbalah, by Persian, I mean people who had a Persian background, uh, uh, who would both speak Persian and, and Arabic, and, and but who were uh, from a uh, uh, long uh, uh, Persian uh, background. The city of Kabbalah at the time was still 
uh, in the in the 60s and the 70s before many uh, Iraqis of, of Iranian background were expelled, deported by uh, by the Iraqi regime to um, to Iran. So Karbala was was a very Iranian-like city, I would say, uh, um, in Iraq. So yes, a group of clerics huh, uh, um, from uh, from Karbala. And what was important, what I came to understand uh, uh, quickly, is that this group of, of clerics were competing with the Shia religious establishment in the city of Najaf. Uh, uh, by Shia religious establishment, I, I mean the Majaiya, and so for those who are not familiar with, with Shia issues, the supreme uh, uh, um, religious authority uh, 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 of, uh, of Najaf. Uh, in particular, say Muhammad Shirazi was like claiming to be a marja, that is a high ranking uh, uh, cleric, uh, a reference for uh, Shia believers. But he was dismissed uh, in his um, in his claim by uh, the uh, the Marjaya of the city of, of Najaf, and so a huge competition uh, unfolded between uh, between the two groups. Um, they were not only uh, um, uh, a group of clerics; they were also uh, activists, uh, and they established a, a political organization named the uh, Islamic Action uh, Organization uh, in Iraq. So in Bahrain, you know, the uh, Shirazist uh, uh, created, organized themselves under uh, the name of the Islamic Front for the Liberation of Bahrain that emerged somewhere in the second half of, of the 70s. Uh, and so the, the program uh, uh, of this uh, uh, movement was, was very clear. It was inspired uh, of the many revolutionary, mostly leftist movement that were present at the time in Bahrain and in other uh, government. Okay, so it was like to overthrow the um, the uh, the regime uh, in Bahrain. The movement was headed by Said Hadi al Mudarisi. I don't have a picture of him, but he was a brother of uh, Said Mohammed Taq al Mudarisi, and so uh, a nephew of uh, Said Mohammed. So it was a family history, pretty much a family history. Said Hadi al Mudarisi, very interestingly, and when when he was forced out of of Iraq with the Shirazi family, uh, his brother and, and many people from from Karbala, he had uh, re-established first in Kuwait and then he had moved to Bahrain uh, um, uh, in the mid uh, um, in the early seventies, uh, uh, and he very quickly obtained the Bahraini citizenship. Something you. I mean, it's in, unimaginable today that uh, like a Shia Iraqi cleric would, would be granted the Bahraini uh, citizenship, but at the time he was not perceived as, as, being, uh, as being a threat. It was perceived like, mostly to be like a conservative Shia cleric who would be very convenient for uh, the Bahraini uh, ruling family, like to counter the leftists who were extremely strong at the time, um, um, in particular in the, in the elected parliament. So, this uh, uh, Islamic front uh, was responsible for a failed uh, coup in Bahrain after the Iranian revolution in 1981. And, and so this is what I mean by brokering the Iranian revolution. They were responsible and uh, Iranians will, will tell you, Iranian diplomats, uh, Iranian activists or pro-Iranian activists in Bahrain will tell you that it was all their own initiative, this coup, that it was not at all uh, 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 remote control from Iran uh, or decided uh, from Tehran. No, it was their own initiative with the support uh, of uh, like uh, 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 parts of the uh, Pasdara and the um, IRGC. The Shirazis now in Saudi Arabia, uh, also uh, in the second half of the of the 70s, created uh, uh, an organization uh, uh, headed by Hassan al-Safar, uh, the Organization for the Islamic Revolution in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the name and itself was taken after the revolution in Iran, but the group pre-existed uh, 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 the Islamic Revolution. Um, Hassan al-Safar is still a very important uh, central political figure in Saudi Arabia uh, today, and they were involved in what is called the Muharram uh, um, uh, 14, um, um, sorry, 1,400 intifada in the in the region of Qatif. Um, Qatif is, is a Shia city in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. And so, in November 1979, there was um, like a, a popular uh, uh, movement uh, 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 with uh, like pictures of Khomeini being raised uh, and so on and so forth. But, but pretty much again, it was like 
uh, driven by uh, uh, these uh, Shirazis organization rather than be directly uh, 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 like uh, driven by um, by uh, by Tehran. So the name uh, the the movement sorry renamed itself the Reform Movement in 1991 uh, 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 because. Uh, 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 it got closer to the, the Saudi monarchy, and so uh, the change in the name tells uh, uh, how much the movement uh, just dropped on the revolutionary uh, project in order to try to uh, uh, reform, uh, uh, act in, in favor of reforming the Saudi monarchy from uh, uh, from uh, from within, and most of its uh, of the leaders of the, the movement were authorized to go back to to um, to Saudi Arabia uh, uh, in like 1993. Uh, <clears throat> Most of them uh, were either in Iran or in Syria or, or in London. The other network, the other Iraqi network that brokered the Islamic revolution uh, in the Gulf and in other um, Arab countries, I think about Lebanon in particular, is the El Dawa Islamiya network and centered around this uh, uh, movement, uh, uh, Iraqi Dawa, um, which we can describe uh, at the time at least uh, uh, as the political arm of the Najafi Marjai. Yeah. So the uh, Shia religious establishment of the city of Najaf. I think here about Mohsin El Hakim, who was at the time the, the, the big Marja. Uh, um, and uh, uh, Mohammed Bakr al-Sadr uh, was the main, uh, the ideologue, I would say, of the, the Dawah movement and a major uh, proponent of, of clerical rule. Um, cells were created uh, uh, in Bahrain in the mid-60s, and most activists joined uh, in the 2000s the, the Wifaq movement, which was the main opposition movement in Bahrain. Uh, which won in particular the majority of seats in the parliament between 2006 and 2010. So the move, the, the network Dawa was much more important than the Shirazist uh, uh, network. This Dawa network was also dominant in Kuwait, uh, uh, with a strong uh, uh, um, block in the in the parliament uh, in particular. So, what can we? Um, um, yes, what? No. Before jumping to my conclusion, so um, uh, what I am arguing uh, is that these Iraqi-centered Shia Islamic networks, so they were responsible for brokering the revolution uh, to the Gulf and beyond uh, across Arab countries. Um, what I uh, like to to argue also is that uh, this shows that the Iranian revolution unfolded in a transnational environment which was spanned by politicized Shia clerical networks, which were connected to the Supreme Shia religious authority in Iraq. Uh, and uh, 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 it's not possible, I think, to understand fully uh, 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 the, the, the so-called exportation of the revolution without taking into account the context that pre-existed the revolution. And this context was pretty much uh, 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 transnational and Iraqi uh, uh, clerical and political networks were absolutely central. This was a, a what I call an ecosystem of activist clerics that were uh, actually uh, supporting various versions of the idea of a clerical government. You know? uh, so the idea of, of, of a clerical government that it was possible for the clerics to appropriate even the political uh, uh, the political prerogatives of the, of the imam uh, uh, was already spread uh, before Khomeini articulated his own Wilayat uh, al-Faqi doctrine uh, uh, in Iraq, uh, for, for example. I think it is only in a, in a second phase, uh, uh, beginning in 1982, that uh, the Iranian state uh, strove to centralize and control the exportation of, of the revolution, uh, meaning it uh, devoted to reduce the agency of Iraqi networks because these Iraqi networks had their own agenda, had their own strategies, their own projects, and sometimes uh, these projects were uh, in line with the own projects and strategies of the Islamic Republic, but sometimes these uh, strategies, these projects uh, colluded. And so it was necessary really to reduce the agency of these networks. 
And this uh, uh, centralization uh, of the strategy of exporting the revolution, uh, this so Iranian centric uh, uh, attempt uh, um, led to tensions within the Iraqi networks. Uh, Al Dawa split in the late 80s, and the Shirazist uh, tensions uh, arose between Mohammed Shirazi himself and the Mudarisi brothers who uh, 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 like had different visions of the what the, their relationship with the Islamic Republic should be um, in particular. So at the end, um, I uh, yes, I um, would like to 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 take back uh, something very important, uh, um, an idea put forward by Aurélie Dyer, who wrote a, a, a book on, on Hezbollah, the history of Hezbollah. She speaks about importation rather than exportation of the revolution for Hezbollah in Lebanon. And I think it's very true uh, overall of uh, how the so-called exportation of the revolution uh, uh, occurred. Um, uh, uh, um, the, for many of these movements uh, in the Arab world who pre-existed the Iranian revolution, the revolution was seen as reshaping the structure of political opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, and uh, uh, the, it was seen as an opportunity like to maybe uh, achieve aims or to dream about, uh, about you know, new possibilities. Um, uh, new possibilities, I mean, really overthrowing the existing regimes and, and, and establishing this uh, like mythical um, Islamic state. Uh, so these groups enthusiastically espoused the ideology uh, of the revolution, and they they asked uh, they, they went to Tehran asking for uh, uh, support, asking uh, uh, for help. And so uh, we should not uh, um, think about like uh, the exportation of the of the revolution being like purely unilateral. Far from that. Well, it was a twofold uh, process with Islamic movements uh, willing, you know, support. And uh, at some point, the Islamic Republic was was wary of the agency of these Iraqi groups, and these groups themselves uh, were wary of Iranian attempts at centralizing uh, uh, um, actions to uh, to uh, uh, to export uh, uh, the revolution. And uh, yes, that's it for me. Thank you so much. I think that was a really analytical and helped us understand uh, the central role of Iraqis and local actors in importing, not uh, in importing the export, put it that way, of the Iranian revolution. Terrific. Uh, so the next speaker will be Simon. Yeah, thanks so much, David, for the introduction. And thank you, Laurence, and also Mohammed, for your remarks. And you both have focused on networks, and I would like to take us a little bit into a different direction for my talk and to focus on ideas. And I'd like to share my presentation now. To a certain extent, I think, um, I hope you can, can you see my presentation? Okay, great. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, Laurence, you've just spoken about sort of dreams and these revolutionary moments. And I think this ties in quite nicely with what I would like to present today. And as Mohammed had said earlier, there's really this tendency to, um, you know, dismiss the uh, impact the revolution had on Sunni groups and how they engaged with the Iran revolution. I would like to counter this perception a little bit in the context of uh, Pakistan, because as I would like to argue, sort of this common view doesn't really take into account these intensive Iranian efforts of trying to reach out to Sunni allies. So Muslim unity was extremely important for the early Islamic revolution, the rejection of both East and West and forging sort of third Islamic ways. And this was successful among university students in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, in other parts of the globe, but also among Islamist movements uh, far and wide. And I would like to argue that, you know, they never really had a naive perception of Iran in this regard. They acknowledged that there were differences in creed, but in the early 1980s, there were other forms of attraction. This could be money, as Laurence has pointed out, influence, other forms. But I would say also uh, what I would like to argue in the context of Pakistan, there was really this perception that Iran essentially was pursuing the same goal, namely to establish 
God's sovereignty on earth. And this was for Pakistani Sunni Islamists an important aspect. And I would like to argue why this is the case in my talk. I would like to, you know, first of all, try to establish why this aspect of divine sovereignty has been so important for the Jama'at Islami in Pakistan. And then would like to present to you shortly three sort of first-hand travel accounts of Jama'at Islami members who traveled to Iran and saw sort of divine sovereignty in action there. And then if there is still time to briefly reflect on why things have changed later. So if we try to, um, sort of briefly uh, discuss the importance of this concept. When you read pieces on Islamism in the Middle East, Said Abu al Maududi, uh, important Pakistani Islamist, often comes up, but he's rarely taken seriously. He's more like an oddity who is also there, perhaps because some of his thought was later taken up in the Middle East by supposedly much more important figures like Said Qutb, who translated this then into the Muslim Brotherhood context and into Arabic. But uh, who is Zayd Abul al Maududi? He portrayed himself uh, as someone who is well versed in the traditional sciences, but he uh, is also in touch you know, with the times. He was someone who uh, worked as a journalist, but said that he also really imbibed Western knowledge and political science, economics, religions, all these sorts of things. And when you look at his early writings, there's a tendency you know, to write anti-colonial aspects, anti-imperialist, even anti-capitalist. But in 1941, this really made a big break in his life when he founded the Jama'at Islami before the partition of the subcontinent into what later became India and Pakistan, because he felt that the Muslim League, the party that was advocating for Pakistan at the time, was too secularist. And for him, uh, Hakimiya, divine sovereignty, was sort of a major concern in that sort of stretches through all of his writings. You know, that's a sort of concept that is to a certain extent well known. It means submission uh, to God is devotion. So inferior man-made laws deviate from this natural harmony between creator and creation. And the importance of this concept is already manifested in the constitution of the Jama'at According to the Jama'at's creedal statement, one is to accept none other than God as the king, beholder of all authority and the supreme power, nor see anyone as capable of commanding, forbidding, and legislating on his own independent authority, for no one except God has the right to ownership and sovereignty. The first goal, consequently, for the party was then to strive for the institution or instituting of religion, which we are told is synonymous with divine government. But what does sort of this particular outlook for the Jamaat then imply? So as Maududi put it, an Islamic state has to encourage and popularize those good practices that Islam decided humanity to adopt and to discourage, eradicate and crush with full force all those evils from which Islam aims to purge mankind. And there you can already see that sort of the powerful state is very high on the agenda, so to speak. And in the context of Pakistan, this was an incredibly successful idea. When we look at the constitution of Pakistan, it has a so-called objectives revolution where the sovereignty of God is already emphasized. This was passed in March 1949, and it reads sovereignty over the entire universe belongs to Allah Almighty alone and the authority which he has delegated to the state of Pakistan and so on. Pakistani ulama spoke about this extensively and uh, it has, an, has been, become an idea that has seemingly become self-evident in the course of the 20th century. Uh, it's even reflected in the later Iranian constitution. And precisely sort of this idea that the Iranians picked up on this and they sort of were also interested in establishing divine sovereignty was, I would like to argue, what drew uh, many of these uh, Pakistani Islamists to Iran. Um, when we look at the first sort of travel account, the first hand experience of the revolution, we can look at the Amir, the leader of the Jamaat Islami, Miantafel Muhammad, and the successor to Maududi, who traveled to Iran in February 1979. He describes meetings he had with leading Iranian officials at this time, and especially with Ibrahim Yazdi, who was the foreign minister at the time. And sort of he engaged with him in his own house. He uh, narrated about uh, sort of the conversations they had, not conversations of tongues, but of hearts, 
as he put it in the end to Phil Mohammed in his travelogue, we felt like members of the same family, travelers in the same caravan, wayfarers to the same destination, who were transporting their provisions to the same place. So Yazdi, in Muhammad's estimate, was fully aware of the history of Islamist struggles and really realistic about the challenges ahead. But which destination did Mian Tufel Muhammad have in mind in this regard? This becomes clearer in two other travelogues that I would like to share with you. One was written by a Karachi a journalist who was also a member of the Jama'at Islami, was very close to Pakistan's military dictator of the 1980s, Sia ul Haq. And in 1982, um, Mohammed Salah al-Din traveled to Iran on the occasion of the third anniversary of the revolution. He serialized this trip in a Jama'at Islami newspaper um, and published in the same year also a book that collected you know, the, all these experiences. And he felt compelled to write this book because in his initial series, he had voiced some sort of criticism about the Iranians he deplored the splintering that was happening in the country, which supposedly opened the doors to, for communists and godless elements. And this really didn't go down well with sort of the Islamist crowd in the context of Pakistan. He received many letters from Jamaat Islami members who so denounced him for denigrating Iran. And so he wrote this book in order to set the record straight. And he is quite clear in his book that he implores God to make Iran into the strong arm of the Islamic world and to protect her from all potential dangers. Um, and he's clear also in his writings that, you know, the support for Iran is never really about Shiism or, you know, that he's aware that there are significant differences, as he puts it in the book. The reason for our support of the Iranian revolution had nothing to do with shared articles of faith. In this regard, the Shah was a Shi too. The true reason for our backing was that we rejected monarchy and were striving for an Islamic democracy. The same applies for our hatred of evil and our commitment to justice. The Islamic forces in Iran advanced their movement under the slogan of Allahu Akbar, and this is our slogan too. So it's precisely this way forward that he sort of acknowledges and that he uh, sort of appreciates for him, the revolution was built on acknowledging the true unicity of God and had offered for the first time the Muslim world an exit out of its misery of ungodly rulership, namely Molokiyat and dictatorship Amiriyat. So Iran was the first Muslim country that really had managed an alliance between religious scholars and um, sort of the university educated youth it had led a truly popular revolution and had endowed the worldwide Islamic movement with the inspiration that only by unity, faith, and martyrdom, the superpowers could be brought down to their knee. But his praise of what was happening in Iran clearly echoed Madhudi in this regard, because he emphasized most of all that the Iranian revolution was a way out of ungodly systems. So as we have seen earlier, for the founder of the Jama'at Islami, Madhudi, um, he considered himself, so every man who considered himself a master, a malik, came dangerously close to assuming divinity. So this was a clear violation of man's expected subordination to God. Um, so Muhammad Salah Hadin continued to voice such views in the, throughout the 1980s, but uh, it probably comes also even clearer, sort of this aspect of Hakimi comes out probably even clearer in the last uh, travelogue that I would like to share with you today by Sayyid Asad Gilani, who um, was, was also a long-time Jama'at Islami member. He had become, in 1971, the Amir, the leader of the uh, Punjab province, you know, Pakistan's most populous, uh, biggest province for the GI, and was also elected member of the Pakistan National Assembly in 1985. And he describes his first encounter with Iran. He traveled there several times in the 1980s as really a very emotional experience. He said, you know, we were on our way to our spiritual home. We were like longing lovers, uh, longing for the water of life that Iran could offer. He describes scenes in hotels where he encounters the Islamist international, all, you know, people excited about the upcoming revolution. And he was very excited to be part of all of this. Um, but he also makes it clear, you know, or he 
criticizes his fellow Sunnis why they should be afraid of Iran and sort of sectarian differences, because he says basically, you know, this is all meaningless. Okay, Iran is a Shi country, but why should Sunnis, given the overwhelming numerical majority, be afraid of this fact there are so many sort of Sunni majority countries that haven't really embarked on the same path as Iran has. Um, and in Gilani's narrative, what followed from superficial uh, sort of uh, engagement with Iran was the, uh, or was basically, he said, we really need to shift our perspective and our obligation for every Muslim in Pakistan is to support the Iranian revolution because the, only, the unexpected event of the revolution has, uh, is the fulfillment of a long ideological struggle for Hakimiya. So his party was nothing less than the eternal enemy of any ungodly sovereignty. And the movement's hostility towards these forms really compelled it to embrace the Iranian model. As he put it, we struggle against the idolatrous government and exhaust our lives to implement God's laws. We don't recognize the distinction between Arabs and non-Arabs. We only care for ideology and the goal. We recognize only truth and falsehood and know only ungodliness and Islam. So Gilani foregrounded the unique nature of the Iranian revolution, which had no precedent or similarity. Yet it was clearly in his views that you know, in his writings, this continues also in the mid 1980s. It was clearly in the Islamic revolution since Muslims had spilled their blood in order to achieve it. And those who had participated in it all professed the Shahada. So to quote him a last time, an Islam built on Quran and Sunnah cannot object to this revolution. Anyone who is versed with Maududi's philo philosophy of Mulukiyat, of, sort of monarchy or ungodly rulership, anyone who is capable of understanding ideology has to acknowledge this revolution as Islamic. And Khomeini, in his view, was in the truest sense of a word an Islamic leader whose thought transcends any Sunni or Shi particularities or differences. His insights draw on sort of a shared Islamist heritage with Hassan al-Banna, Said Qutb, and Ali Shariati, all represented in Maududi's ideas. And sort of as a final consequence, what this all means and what the Iranian model has shown that, uh, that basically a system that does not acknowledge God as the true owner of sovereignty can never be transformed in a gradual and slow fashion. It is definitely not enough to only cut off its heads. Uh, the roots of Tahut, of sort of, um, uh, you know, of tyranny run deep and, and it clings to society like an octopus, which means that it will always again raise its had given the many groups from capitalists to worldly ulama and the media that are benefiting from its ways. So only a thorough and radical revolution can really be the proper answer to this issue uh, modeled uh, on Iran, basically. The issue though um, that is interesting and sort of for the final minute or so that I have, I would like to briefly touch on this is why the Jama'at Islami distanced itself from these views. So we see another trend throughout the 1980s that more and more moves away from Iran. Sort of uh, other scholars have suggested that this might have had to do with the Jamaat Islami becoming more and more dependent on financial contribution from the Gulf monarchies. Um, and we, it's really hard to pinpoint a definite you know, break, but we can at least see that, for example, a very international the seminar that they held in 1989, Iran, was no longer on the agenda, even though basically the entire creme de la creme of the Islamist world attended this seminar in Lahore. But it's, it's, uh, Iran, at this point, at least in 1989, did no longer play a role. And I would like to argue that maybe one of the reasons that sort of the Jamaat Islami became more and more skeptical was precisely because the revolution happened in a two rash and profound manner. So something that Said Asad Gilani, whom we just heard, embraced, but for many other Jama'at Islami members, they really urged caution because also Maududi's own understanding of revolution and of establishing divine sovereignty has been more a gradual process um, and sort of careful, uh, patient struggle 
because in his view, this was seemingly more successful in the end and you could establish a more um, sort of stable system in this regard. And of course, there are were also uh, Jamaat Islami members who pointed out that the ecumenical message that Iran was trying to project was also sometimes incongruent and there were sort of problems with this as well. So let me conclude. In my talk today, I've tried to briefly, you know, highlight some of the aspects of the Jama'at Islamis complex relationship with post-revolutionary Iran. I've argued that they had a remarkably persistent, positive attitude toward uh, Iran. On the one hand, this had to do with sort of the staple of Islamist demands, like the admiration for the Islamization of Islam Iran's secular laws, imposing the veil, these sorts of things, restructuring society along the lines of the of an Islamic Republic. But it was clearly this issue of Hakimiya that was in the air of divine sovereignty that captured the attention of certain inf influential voices within the party. Sort of in their view, the divine government envisioned by Maududi as a necessary outflow of acknowledging God's sovereignty was really on the cusp of being put into reality in Iran. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. It is a good compliment to uh, Laurence's presentation. Shift geographically from uh, from west to east, shift in from from, uh, sh from Shias to Sunnis, and a shift from a focus on networks to a focus on uh, ideology. So our final speaker is uh, Raphael. Please. Thank you, David, and thanks a lot for the invitation. Well, we're going to travel back to the west uh, in my presentation. Uh, and also travel a little bit ideologically. Um, so the title of my talk is From Leftism to Islamism, How the Iranian Revolution Spurred Ideological Change During the Lebanese Civil War. And what I'll do in the next 15 minutes or so is introduce the topic, then go through three case studies, and finally uh, wrap up with some uh, broader remarks. So let's delve right away into um, essentially which trend that has been uh, relatively overlooked in the literature, and, and, and it is essentially the uh, sheer uh, impact of the Iranian Revolution uh, on the Lebanese uh, scene, and in particular when it comes uh, to uh, the ideological dynamics and shifts uh, from the leftist trend to the Islamist trend. Uh, this graph is quite telling. The Iranian Revolution spurred the growth of Islamist armed groups, which you can see on the chart is um, essentially the evolution of the number of Islamist armed groups active during the Lebanese civil war. As you can see, there are only a couple until uh, 1977. And then during the time of the Iranian revolution, uh, the number doubles uh, from two to four and five. Then there is a decline, but this decline is misleading because some groups merge with one another. And in the interviews that I did with um, rank and file uh, members, fighters, leaders, as well of uh, some of these groups that got created precisely then during the time of the Iranian revolution, they really pinpoint uh, the Iranian revolution as a cause, as an inspiration uh, for the creation of uh, some of these groups. So what are these groups about, these new Islamist groups that got created during the time of the Iranian revolution? Well, the common view, of course, is that the Iranian revolution empowered Shia Islamists uh, throughout the Middle East, and of course, in particular, in Lebanon, with the case of Hezbollah. But half of all of the new groups that got created in 1978-1979 were Sunni. Half were also Shia. But what characterized most of them were their uh, leftist background, their leftist origins. Some simply had some former leftist members, but others were actually originally leftist armed groups that actually switched ideologies in 1978, 1979, became Islamist. So that really begs the question, how did the Iranian revolution trigger such a significant ideological change in late 70s and early 80s Lebanon? So let me get into uh, three cases of such groups that were originally leftist and became Islamist. The first one is the popular resistance, and Qawam al uh, an originally Marxist uh, armed group operating in the northern city of uh, Tripoli in Lebanon. It was known as Friends of Lenin at first, 
uh, kind of driving the point home about the uh, original uh, Marxist beliefs of uh, these the members of this group. This was a group that was always quite active in street protests, rioting, urban violence. There always seemed to be a good cause to, to rebel, to protest against poverty, feudalism, Western imperialism, you name it. So it's not so surprising that when the Lebanese civil war erupted in 1975, uh, this uh, group turned into a militia and sided right away with a left, leftist camp in the Lebanese uh, civil war. But the more surprising aspect is how it became months after the Iranian revolution in 1980, an Islamist group. It embraced Islamism. So why? Well, I think the key to understand the ideological shift of the popular resistance from the left, from Marxism uh, to Islamism, is the way in which the Iranian revolution introduced a revolutionary dimension to Islamist ideology and Islamist thinking. It turned Islamism into a rebel ideology. The popular resistance had long been critical of the Muslim brothers, not necessarily because of their uh, religious uh, uh, component or their, their focus on religion, but really because this was a group that had long uh, 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 tried to be a gradualist group, trying to engage with political system, running for elections, and mostly eschewing violence, not adopting a truly revolutionary uh, position. In this respect, the Iranian revolution had uh, what members of the group told me was, was a deep impact on them. Uh, I was told that they started forming uh, circles uh, uh, around radio posts and television stations and really following collectively the events that led to the downfall of the Shah. And, and they were really inspired uh, by all of that. They were really inspired by Khomeini's rebel stance. Khomeini to them seemed to be uh, a rebel in every respect. He seemed to be against the Shah of Iran, against the US, against Israel, and he followed through with actions. So in that sense, many found it uh, natural to switch from Marxism, from one protest or rebel ideology, Marxism, to another, Islamism. And what appealed to them, I was told, was really Islam's rebel potential. So that's in the case of the popular resistance. Let's now turn to the second case, the case of the student brigade. The student brigade was an originally, not Marxist, but Maoist armed group created in 1976 in Beirut as a Maoist militia, one close to the PLO, very, very close indeed to the PLO, and one especially using South Lebanon as a platform, as a base to attack uh, the Israeli army. Um, what this group was essentially was a, a gathering of uh, students who had pro-Palestinian leanings and were from all over the country and all over uh, sectarian affiliations, some Sunnis, Shias, Christians as well, including this figure on the right, Munir Shafi, who was the spiritual godfather of the student brigade and was a Christian who then converted to Islam in 1981. He then drew the entire group in, Maoism, in, in Islamism. Uh, with him in 1981. So why? Why this collective shift from Maoism to Islamism in the case of the Student Brigade in 1981? Well, here we have to go back to the original goal of the Student Brigade, which was really to root itself in South Lebanon in order to fight Israel, to embed itself in local populations. And as a Maoist group, members had in mind the Maoist concept of the mass line, which essentially uh, is about um, um, pushing armed groups uh, that try to stir up revolution to engage in local popular beliefs, in traditions, be respectful of these beliefs and of these traditions. So because during the 1970s, there was still some momentum for pan-Arabism and to a lesser degree for uh, nationalism, they used this rhetoric in the 70s. But when the Iranian revolution happened, it showed them, I was told by members of the group, that religion could also mobilize the masses. This was a truly popular Islamic revolution, bringing the masses into the streets, mobilizing local communities. And so the student brigade, out of a willingness to adapt to this uh, 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 local you know, ideological momentum of Islamism that was also on the rise in South Lebanon, a Shia 
uh, dominated part of, of Lebanon, started using mosques, started using religious discourse. What appealed to the group was the popular dimension of Islam and of the ideology of the uh, uh, Iranian revolution. The third and final uh, brief case study I wanted to get into to, to exemplify these uh, leftist to Islamist shifts is the case of the movement of Arab Lebanon, Harakat Lebanon al Arabi. Um, as its name suggests, suggests, this was an originally Arab nationalist armed group, one uh, gathering around 500 fighters in between Beirut and Tripoli with a mixed social base, some students, but some poor members as well. This was a group that fought against Israel in the hills of South Lebanon. You can see a picture here of one of the prominent battles they led in the late 70s alongside the student brigade. They were very close to the student brigade. Um, and another important aspect that, that will uh, become relevant in the next slide is uh, the group's involvement in uh, training, um, in training Lebanese leftists and also foreigners who came in the PLO uh, military camps in uh, Lebanon. So that's a group that, that an, an Arab nationalist group that embraced Islamism in 1979. So very, very early on uh, in the uh, Iranian revolution. So why here again? And the reason behind uh, their shift uh, was really that they saw in the Iranian revolution and the birth of the Islamic Republic, an opportunity to get external sponsorship, to get support, to get weapons, money, diplomatic support, networks, um, this group, the movement of Arab Lebanon, had an old alliance, a very important alliance with another external actor, the PLO. But the PLO in the late 70s and the early 80s was coming increasingly under a lot of pressure from Syria and from Israel. So the Iranian revolution really came to members of the group as a chance, as really as a chance to diversify uh, their external uh, support, to get one additional ally on the board. Um, and this was especially so because, as I said in the previous slide, the movement of Arab Lebanon had had a key role in training Lebanese leftists, but also some foreigners who came to get military skills and training in the PLO run camp. That included some Iranian anti Shah dissidents in the 1970s, some of whom would end up becoming the new leaders or important officials in the Islamic Republic post-1979. So they had shared networks, they knew and trusted each other. And that explains why um, the movement of Arab Lebanon was quite keen uh, when the uh, Islamic Republic was born uh, to, to forge a very strong alliance with it. And, and here in this respect, uh, uh, Mohammed's mention of the Office of uh, Freedom Movement in the IRGC is, is quite significant because uh, this is really the unit with which the movement of Arab Lebanon had a very strong ties to and, and got support from. Uh, the movement of Arab Lebanon's leader, Hasmat Murad, uh, went nine times to Tehran to secure this new strong alliance with Iran in between 1979 and 1980. So what appealed to the group here was really the prospect of Iranian sponsorship. And so to conclude, Because this is not just a Lebanese trend. Uh, the Iranian revolution had a deep ideological impact in the Middle East outside of, of course, just Lebanon. Um, Laurence mentioned the ways in which it empowered uh, Shia Islamist movements in the region, uh, absolutely. And uh, Simon also mentioned the ways in which it also acted as, as inspiration um, for uh, Sunni Islamist movements with the case of, of Pakistan. It also inspired other Islamist movements, uh, uh, Sunni Islamist movements outside, of, outside of, of Iran, especially the students' wings of the Muslim Brothers in uh, Egypt, in Tunisia, in Palestine. It radicalized other pre-existing Islamist groups. But really my talk was about uh, the way in which it spurred uh, uh, leftist to Islamist uh, shifts. And here a prominent non-Lebanese example is the case of Palestinian Islamic Jihad, one faction of which uh, comes out of, of Maoism and of uh, people who uh, switched to uh, Islamism. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. So th th that's terrific. There's a tremendous amount on the table and to wrap it all together and get the conversation going, I'm going to turn it over to Mohammed. Thank you. It was really fascinating to listen to the uh, conversations uh, about how the revolution uh, in 1979 uh, transpired in different national contexts. Since uh, we want to leave some more time for question and answers, I'm going to be very brief. Uh, uh, so, uh, one uh, point is that when we are talking about the relationship between the revolutionary Iran and uh, uh, these uh, factions in whether in Lebanon or uh, in Iraq, uh, it's also very interesting to think about uh, the, the interaction with different factions within the Islamic Republic. So, uh, uh, like uh, the Internationalization of the IRGC began in 1980 um, in a very crucial junctures in the consolidation of the Islamic Republic and Iran-Iraq war. And, and uh, it also was the beginning of the clerical factionalism inside the Islamic Republic. And some of these factions that, for example, once um, talk about, like, for example, the Shirazin, the Modaracy brothers, they're very allied with like the internationalist uh, uh, revolutionaries in, in Iran. And, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, they, uh, they were uh, uh, very influential initially within the revolution. I mean, the Modaracies were leading the Rasalin network. And uh, when the, uh, Ayatollah Montazari was ousted from power in Iran uh, by the end of, by 1989, the, the modernities and the entire network lost influence within the Islamic Republic. So I just want to say that it's also important to think like, you know, the connection between these Islamists and the, these different factions within the Islamic Republic. And one other point is about the, uh, like continuity between pre-revolution and post-revolution in Iran. Um, I mean, usually historians tend to think about the revolution in terms of a clean rupture from the Shah era to the Islamic Republic. But uh, as um, uh, we know, uh, the Shah, for example, in the context of Iraq and Lebanon was deeply invested in supporting uh, the Shia, the Shia leaders, and even some of the very clerics that the Islamic Republic later on embraced and supported. So I, I think it's important when we're talking about reassessing the impact of the revolution, we also think about the continuity from the, uh, like, at least from the time of the Pahlavi era to the Islamic Republic and the similarities between the two era in terms of uh, uh, how Iran um, like established links with uh, these uh, Shia leaders uh, in Lebanon and Iraq and elsewhere. Thank you. Terrific. So I'm, there's, there's a number of questions that have been submitted, and I encourage others uh, to submit your questions via the Q&A button. And I want to give the panelists a chance to perhaps ask questions or engage with each, other, each other's arguments. But I'm, I'm going to jump in and ask a few questions and modify them and add some. So Jim Muir asks, it's a question mainly for Lawrence, but if others would like to speak on it as well. Given that Shia Islamic activist groups existed before the Iranian revolution, and there was a degree of mutual suspicion thereafter, what would be the impact on those groups in Iraq, Lebanon, et cetera, in the admittedly perhaps unlikely event of a big change in Tehran, like a counter-revolution, a coup overthrow, or change the revolutionary behavior as a result of the JCPOA? Could the Hashid Ashabi in Iraq and Hezbollah and, and Lebanon thrive and develop in the absence of strong ties with Tehran? Or what adjustments would they need to make? Thank you. Um, obviously, the, the context that I talked about, uh, the context of uh, the 70s and the 80s, is very different from the context of today. One of my conclusions um, um, in my work about Shia Islamist movements in, uh, in the Gulf and even in the Arab world is that uh, there have been a dynamic of what I call nationalization in the sense that these transnational uh, movements connected to the Iraqi networks and then after the revolution to the Iranian uh, uh, networks 
uh, got uh, disillusioned with the revolution, the Iranian revolution, uh, came to realize that Iran had its own agenda and that uh, it would not be ready, for example, anymore uh, after the death of Khomeini in particular, uh, uh, to support revolution in Bahrain, for example, uh, even less in Kuwait. Uh, um, and so they, 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 they shifted, uh, and the, 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 they shifted to nationalism. They shifted ideologically. Uh, they found the, the, the ideological solution was to say, well, will we, we will become somehow, it's me who describes it like this, uh, um, like that, they, they became communal movements. That is movements really focused on representing the Shias in a certain country and defending the interest of the Shias as a specific community, say in Bahrain or uh, um, in Kuwait or, um, or in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. And so, uh, they, they develop uh, uh, really a, a nationalist and national uh, 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 narrative saying, uh, oh, well, uh, we don't have ideological and political connections to Iran or even to, to, to Iraq. We are autonomous. We have our own program, our own agenda, and this uh, agenda and program is dictated by the specificities of our national context. And the Iraqis, I mean, moved in the same direction. Now, uh, when uh, we discovered uh, Iraq after, we, when we rediscovered Iraq after the fall of Saddam Hussein in 2003, we realized that Muqtada Sadr was there. And what was Muqtada Sadr? A Shia communal nationalist movement, Iraqi movement, uh, uh, very critical uh, uh, of the Islamic Republic. The Dawah movement itself, huh? the clerical wing nearly disappeared, the pro Iranian clerical wing disappeared. What remained were the lay men like uh, Maliki, uh, Jafari, who were very nationalist. And uh, all these people just uh, could do nothing against uh, the expansion of Iranian networks to Iraq, and they regretted it. I'm sure they did everything they could to prevent it, but they could not prevent and they needed help also, uh, uh, logistical support, material support, political support to maintain themselves politically, to, to survive. And I think what has happened uh, throughout the 20, after the, the fall of Saddam Hussein, it's like a, uh, Iran regaining like power over the Iraqi movements. But I wouldn't say out of idea of shared ideology, but rather out of shared interest. Uh, so now you tell me if uh, the Iranian uh, uh, Republic, the Islamic Republic falls down and a new regime uh, 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 emerges in Iran, what will happen for Hasha Chabi? I'm pretty sure that Hasha Chabi will be able to live uh, um, a life of, of its own and, and it will have like to, to reframe its ideology, to, to reframe itself. But uh, I mean, we've seen a very radical shift from revolution to reform with the Shia Islamist uh, uh, movements in Saudi Arabia. So I'm, I'm pretty sure we could see that again. Uh, uh, my argument is that these movements are very adaptive and, and, and pretty much able to, to, to shift. That's terrific. I just want to add one thing. One great understudied topic about post-invasion Iraq is the Shiraziines, both the Mudadisis and the Shirazis. They come back to Karbala. They try to reestablish a Karbala group and they, they fail, in my opinion, miserably. Politically, they have very little influence outside Karbala and religiously, despite setting up shops throughout the country in the Shia areas, at least, they just, they haven't developed much. And the funny thing is they, they had a lot of resources, tons of experience with media and the internet, more so than a lot of these other groups, including the Sudderists, but they, they lost. And that's a really understudied topic. We, we focus a lot on Dao and Badr and the groups that did well. We don't, we don't focus on the groups that came back, the exile groups that came back in 2003 and did poorly. Uh, it's, it's, it's a neat understudied example for anyone who wants to write a dissertation out there. Um, and just just, uh, just a comment on that. I mean, it's very important for students and academics to study why groups or people fail politically, you know, and so it's it's a very good uh, yes topic for a PhD student, for example. So uh, kind of along the same lines, there's a couple of questions about is ideology exportable? What what's the scope and depth of Iran's export of the Islamic Revolution? Um, and asked to kind of compare it to Bolshevism to some extent. But I also wanted to, to, to link back up to a, a question from William Sorger to Raphael, which I think fits, it fits very well here. Were there any leftist camps in Lebanon that changed yet again? 
from his from leftism presumably to Islamism and then to something else after infighting Iran or loss of support uh, or did what was that commitment to Islamism sticky uh, that's not the word that he uses but was there an ideological commitment there that was harder to abandon That's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Uh, is, is ideology sticky? That's like even a broader question, a very interesting one. Um, for quite some time, because the Iranian revolution and the um, Islamic Republic that came out of it stuck with its anti-imperialist positions, a lot of these people remained Islamists and pro-Iran, sometimes Sunni Islamists in the case of Lebanon. Um, but the short answer is that Post-2011, with the uh, uh, IRGC and Hezbollah and other uh, uh, pro-Iran actors' intervention in the Syrian civil war, uh, with which uh, uh, a lot of, of Lebanese feel very close to, um, that, that has changed quite a bit. And so you, you, I've seen a lot of, of these uh, people questioning uh, the extent to which the Islamic revolution was really uh, uh, that much always about anti-imperialist, uh, about anti-imperialism, uh, arguing that for a long time it was, uh, but that more and more Iran and the forces allied with it abroad have turned into forces of the status quo. And we see the Hashid al-Shabi in, in Iraq cracking down on protesters in, in Iraq, Hezbollah playing a role in the crackdown also on protesters in, in Lebanon in the past couple of years. Uh, uh, and, and of course, the Iranian uh, uh, model itself is being challenged from within uh, increasingly. So I think that has, that has really changed the thinking of uh, a lot of these uh, groups. Uh, I also wanted to uh, make a point to follow up on something that was talked about before. Uh, uh, I think it was Jim's question about how could Shia Islamists do with, without Iran outside of, outside of Iran. Um, and, and I take the point, of course, that that uh, Dawa and some Iraqi uh, Shia Islamist groups um, might want to adapt to local context and really become about, about reform and so on and so forth. But I wouldn't underestimate the ideological, the continuous ideological appeal of some of these groups for the uh, Iranian, uh, for the Islamic Republic's model. Hezbollah is one of them, and Hezbollah has acquired to some extent uh, a capacity of its own to uh, support uh, some groups abroad. And we've seen that in the past decade in Syria, Hezbollah was a de facto sponsor of the creation of, of a lot of Shia Islamist armed groups in Syria. Uh, we've also seen that in Iraq before and just wanted to, to nuance that a little bit. Um, I think the Islamic Republic's ideological imprint, imprint is, still, is still very sticky in this respect for uh, some of these uh, Shia Islamist uh, armed groups. So I, I have my own question and it's for any of you who'd like to take it up. The panel has focused a lot on brokers, on the local actors who, who transmitted through networks, the ideology or, or ways of mobilizing of, of these groups. But I'm gonna make a counter argument. That, that's not really the key factor. The, the key factor was the strength of the states at the time. I recently had to go back and find a, a site in Hana Batatu's massive book on Iraq. And reading Batatu, there's, there's, a, there's an optimism about Iraq because the book is published in 1978. This is the pinnacle of the of Arab state strength. And so when, when you were giving your examples, all of you, you were talking about 1981 failed coup in Bahrain, failed coup, or, or uprising the Intifada in 79 in Saudi Arabia. These were, these were very short-term events because the states were very good at cracking down, which is why that first wave was 79 to 82. And where, where it takes root and has a longer lifespan are places which were weaker, perhaps Pakistan, although the state was involved in someone in, in Lebanon. And so I'm wondering if the real strength of the, the real factor here isn't so much the brokers or even the ideology or the networks. It's really the states, the, the strength of the states uh, to crack down and prevent this from, from having an impact on societies. And that was very high in 79 to 82. But today, as we're talking about Hashid al-Shabi, we're talking about Iran's influence in the region, there's been, a, there's been a dramatic shift in the strength of states in the Arab world relative to their societies. And so I'm just wondering if we're, we're focusing too much on the brokers and not enough on the state, on the states and the strength of the state and how that's changed over the 42 years since the Iranian revolution. That, for if anyone wants to take that up. 
Yeah, I just have a, a point to make uh, in response. I'm not sure it's so much about the strength of the state as such, but rather the conflictual situation that some of these countries go through. Um, I mean, Lebanon did not have any more state from 1975, 1976 onwards, but we really see uh, the, the growth of uh, uh, Islamist armed groups uh, pro-Iran uh, during a time when Israel starts invading and, and Syria is occupying lots of uh, parts of the country. Uh, this is also the case with uh, Afghanistan, another, another country we haven't mentioned until now, but it has seen really uh, during the 1980s uh, a lot of spread of uh, pro-Iran as well, uh, Shia Islamist armed groups. Uh, this is the case more recently in, of course, uh, uh, Syria. And so I wonder whether uh, the factor here is perhaps more the civil war, the violence that comes with it, the need for external resources on the part of some of these groups. And of course, Iran and other brokers are, are there to uh, bring some of that. The search for broader meaning as well. Um, so perhaps that, that is also uh, an interesting lens, the, the importance of civil war and, and the violence that comes with it as a factor uh, for some of these phenomena. And just to, to, to follow up, uh, um, um, I think you, you're right in underlining the strength of the state, especially when we speak about the Gulf monarchies. I mean, uh, the revolutionary attempts were uh, unsuccessful because the, the states were, were very strong for all sorts of reasons, but the states could not prevent the spread of the ideology. Uh, among Shia communities and uh, and the spread of the the the, the, the Shia Islamist ideologies has been tremendous. Uh, uh, again, uh, speaking of Al Wifaq, uh, the, this uh, uh, somehow the heir of Dawah, she was uh, incorporated in in, in Al Wifaq. It was in the in the two thousands uh, uh, um, uh, um, and until it was banned in in twenty sixteen. It was really the mass movement that won. Uh, all the city it could win in the in the Shia uh, populated uh, uh, areas. Uh, um, but, but when I speak about ideology, it's not an Iranian-like ideology. It's the ideology uh, that was developed before the Islamic Revolution. That uh, Shia are a specific community, uh, uh, they and the clerics are very important to lead the community. The clerics should take political positions. The clerics should head political movement. They should, uh, they should uh, uh, also uh, lead. I mean, lead the people, and and and, and uh, uh, so the the until today we, we see how popular these kinds of ideas uh, are uh, among among Shias um, um, in the Gulf, despite um, the, the 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 drop of the the the, the revolutionary ideal, and despite the drop of the project of establishing an Islamic republic, uh, a cleric a clerical. A Shia clerical government. This idea is not popular anymore on my fields. That's for sure. Uh, and as I was saying, movements have moved uh, from revolution to communalism. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, clerics have a tremendous uh, uh, influence, and uh, and this is one of the legacies I think uh, of the Iranian Revolution and of the the the, the actions of the the Iraqi uh, networks. I think I also would like to push back a little bit against this notion of the state in this regard, David, because I think what's interesting is in the context also of Pakistan, when you look there, sort of um, those Shi groups who were really successful in pressuring the state in the early 1980s for concessions, they weren't really aligned so much with Iran. And those people who were in touch with Iran, they tried more to build bridges with Sunni authors, trying to downplay some of the Shi messages. And, you know, for example, uh, Said Arif Hussein al Husseini, one of the most important leaders in the 1980s, would make the case that Vilayat al-Faqib applies only in the domain of economics and is not really a political concept. They only want to transform the, you know, Pakistan's economy because this was really a time of vicious sectarianism in the 1980s. And it's only now, today, we have a younger generation of Shi scholars uh, trained in Iran who are really adopting uh, the Hezbollah model, what uh, sort of Rafael also said. They, they accuse the Iranians of having become sort of too lukewarm. They have strayed from the revolution, but Hezbollah is really the group that uh, still pursues sort of the, the true revolution and which could also serve as a model since it's similar to Lebanon. Shis are not a majority. Well, I, 
even you know maybe more minority than in Lebanon, but they could really turn around the country in this regard. And I, I think you know there are many other aspects that these uh, actors took into account, but it was not so much only the state, but also sort of the internal competition with many actors on the ground. And could I also ask a question for, for Raphael, if I, <laughs> if I already have the mic. Raphael, I was really um, uh, impressed by your very structured and um, uh, sort of clear presentation. And you presented as a very neat and convincing typology of these different groups and for what reasons they uh, adopted Islamism, you know, be it, because Khomeini was a great rebel, because they could maybe mobilize more, or because there were prospects for support. But I was just wondering, you know, you this came out in interviews you did, and when you look at sort of declarations of these groups or what they published in the early 1980s, does this sort of match? Would they frame it in different or in you know similar terms in their proclamation during this time, or is this more really an internal discussion that you have brought out in these interviews? So how do you? How do these two sort of match to a certain extent? I would be curious if you could speak to this. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, so out of the three groups I looked at, one never had a publication, the Popular Resistance. It was mobilizing in a poor neighborhood of Tripoli, especially, and, and uh, mobilizing a lower class activists. Um, so for them, but we have videos of actually the, the leader uh, of, of the group. So. Uh, that that's a group that talks about um, really being being rebel, and we have sermons of uh, the uh, leader of the group in a mosque in in 1984 uh, talking about Islam being a weapon a weapon for revolution, which is not a particularly orthodox way of of putting it. It shows the underlying instrumentalism that was going on, I think, uh, back at the time. Um, for for the others, uh, you see in publications uh, so. The, the student brigade, which which had uh, a publication, um, did mention in some of their publications, for instance, uh, the importance of, of mobilizing locally and the importance of tailoring to local context. And if the local context is about the momentum of a particular ideology, uh, uh, then then this is something that that we need to do. Um, so, so there is evidence, but obviously uh, interviews are the most, uh, uh, I mean, because people reflect uh, critically also 30 or 40 years later, it adds, uh, I think, some, some critical elements. Um, there was also another question, if I wonder if I, if I could uh, respond, I for, forgot to respond earlier, is ideology exportable, which links with uh, some of the discussions we've had in the past 20 minutes? I, I think that was a great question. Um, it took me some time to think through it. Uh, but now I, I think that looking a little bit back and, and hearing the other presentations, my sense is that if the, 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 the let's say Iran uh, wants to export its ideology but adapt to local contexts, uh, there is a chance that, that this ideology can be exportable. So the case of Hezbollah is quite interesting because Hezbollah had this ideological bond with the Islamic Republic, had a clear uh, allegiance to Wilayat al Fakir. And of Khomeini and then Khamenei. So it was uh, an exported product in that respect, but it's also a group that co opted local tribes, a group that drew on communal grievances. Uh, uh, Laurence was, was mentioning that before, and that's, that's perfectly uh, important. Um, and a group that, that also mobilized other elements of, of the local context that perhaps made the group. Uh, uh, that gave the group probably a lot of, of popularity and made it a, a long-standing actor on the Lebanese scene. By contrast, when, when we try to think about groups that had this ideology but didn't really try or couldn't adapt to the local context, and one might think about uh, the Badr organization in 1980s uh, during the Iran-Iraq war. Badr was based in Iran, not in Iraq, although it was an, Iraq, an Iraqi group. Um, perhaps it was less able to adapt to local context as a result, and, and it is quite striking that this group is less popular than, than others, uh, in, um, or has become less popular than others ever since uh, 2003 uh, in Iraq. So perhaps there is also part of an answer here, uh, the extent to which uh, an ideology or the group embracing it uh, is uh, willing to adapt to the local context as well. So if, if I can ask a question that kind of ties in, I think, a lot of the themes that we've been discussing here. Um, I think there's a, there's a perception that 
the Islamic Republic has been better than others in the Middle East over the past 42 years in, depending on how you want to phrase it, nurturing clients, attracting local brokers who have their own incentives, or exporting ideology. They've been better than Gaddafi. They were better than Saddam's Ba'ath Party. They're better than Saudi Arabia today, who's trying to do some of the same things, and certainly better than the United States of America, right? They, I, I, Pakistan actually hasn't been bad, but in a different set of countries. Pakistan has been quite successful at this uh, in Kashmir and Afghanistan, but let's, let's leave Pakistan aside. Do you agree with that assessment that the Islamic Republic has just been better at this than other actors? And if so, why? And have the factors for that success changed over time? This kind of ties into the ideas of its, its, its appeals has narrowed over time from broad to more communal. And we've mentioned ideology, experience, Muhammad brought up organizational experience. So I'm, do you agree with that assessment and what were the key factors from for, over, over the last 40 years? Have they changed? Why is Iran perceived to be better? Um, I can try <laughs> an answer. Uh, uh, this is a very, I don't know if Iran is better, but uh, this goes back, my answer goes back to what Rafael was, was just saying. Uh, I think Iran has been very good at being pragmatic. And after the death of Khomeini, uh, to let uh, uh, Shia Islamic movements outside of Iran live their life. Uh, uh, adapt to the local context. They, they've not, un, I mean, under Khamenei, I mean, Iran has, uh, you know, ceased to want to in, export its ideology, strictly speaking. You know, it, it started to merely want to export influence. And he probably realized, or, or I did it like that, I, I don't know, but that this meant, uh, uh, you know, uh, letting uh, like the, the, the brokers, I think about Hezbollah in particular, uh, uh, um, 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 analyze uh, uh, the situation and adapt to the situation. One very striking example is when you, do, you speak to Hezbollah uh, activists in Lebanon, they will tell you, yes, we are in favor of Ulayat al faqih Yes, we support Ali Khamenei. We recognize this, the Wali Amr al-Muslimin. Yes, of course. The Islamic Republic, that's wonderful, but only for Iran. Here in Lebanon, it's not possible because we, have, we are a multi-sectarian society. We have had a civil war, so we recognize that we need to compromise with other uh, communities. And so that an Islamic Republic, it's not possible. A Kuwaiti Hezbollah, you know, the, the, the Kuwaiti pro-Iranian who dominated really the, 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 the Shia political scene in, in the past decades, they will tell you Wilayat al faqih it's excellent, but not for Kuwait. It's only implementable in Iran. And so Iranian leaders do not seem to have a problem with that. Uh, uh, and, and even the Iraqi experience goes in the same direction in the sense that uh, Iran did not want, did not try to export the Islamic Republic model to Iraq. It sought to have influence, uh, 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 whatever, uh, and, and so it, it got its hands in all sorts of, of groups, uh, 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 Shia groups, of course, but even Sunni groups, if I believe some. Uh, um, so maybe pragmatism, adaptability, and not being too, uh, you know, uh, hard about ideology, strictly speaking, and wilayat al faqih and so on and so forth. Uh, it's maybe one of the, the reasons why it has been successful. If I want to add something. Uh, so um, why Iran has been more successful, if probably we can uh, say that. Uh, I think it's partly because the Islamic Republic is relying on the influence of the uh, revolutionary ideology, even though the, uh, the revolutionary Iran's appeal has uh, become thinner, especially after what happened in Syria and uh, uh, after uh, like you know, the invasion of Iraq by the US. Uh, uh, but uh, I think uh, Iran is relying on a mix of revolutionary ideology, pragmatism, as uh, Laurent said. Uh, uh, and also, um, we also should think about the that Iran is um, using the historical ties with the Shia communities, especially in, in Iraq, in Lebanon, and Bahrain. Uh, 
so uh, I think all these factors plus opportunism, and uh, especially in certain contexts like Lebanon, because of having a weak uh, central government that has allowed Iran to establish its influence and consolidate its influence through actors like Hezbollah. So uh, um, I think there are a mix of factors that has enabled Iran to gain uh, influence and build these uh, transnational network of influence across the region. And just one uh, quick point about the, the exportability of the ideology. I think like uh, you can think about the revolution as an uh, ideological force. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Iranian revolution, its initial impact came in terms of its ideas and examples. I mean, the very fact that uh, charismatic uh, Kelerik, like Khomeini, led the revolution and overthrew a powerful uh, dictator, the Shah, that really inspired activism and uprising in Iraq, in, in the Eastern Saudi Arabia, and in Bahrain. And the states were not really able to control the flow of the ideology. Uh, at the time, um, in the early 1980s, uh, one time the former Prime Minister Mir Hossein Mousavi was boasting that Iran is an ideological superpower to say that we can really challenge like, you know, the East, the Soviet Union and the West. And I think that was to some extent true. I mean, Iran was able to use the, like, you know, the power of revolutionary ideas and example to, to like spread its example. So uh, I, go ahead, Raphael, did you want to say something? Yeah, just adding a couple of, of points to the excellent points just made. Um, so we just had uh, attracting brokers as, as an important factor, the idea of the revolution. I think there's also something more structural in terms of like um, where, where the Shias live, often they experience grievances. That was the case in 1980s, Afghanistan, in South Lebanon, uh, in Syria as well. Uh, so building on Shia grievances probably uh, uh, also helps Iran being better at proxy wars, which I think uh, is an important point to make, David. Uh, uh, and I think it holds. Um, I think there are also a couple of other points. Um, it is worth noting that uh, where, she, where, where Iran is good at sponsoring uh, local allies, it's often on the military militant scene, uh, more so than on the political scene. Um, and there might be, you know, an element of, of experience there of uh, some of, you know, these uh, uh, Iranian officials who uh, fought in the 70s already in South Lebanon, who have uh, a background in militancy, are skilled, and then uh, the creation of the IRGC, uh, of course, builds on that. Um, Iran seems to be also quite a reliable actor, one that um, local groups on the ground feel is, is you know, it's not going to let them down. Uh, that's not always the case with, with the Saudis or with others. Uh, and, and that might play uh, a role in some uh, cases. I can see Laurence was shaking her head because of course the Shirazi and were let down. That's true, you have a counter example here. But on the whole, uh, uh, there's been 40 years of support for groups that are still around. Um, and one, uh, one last point, uh, we've, we've downplayed ideology's role a lot uh, in the past hour and a half and I think uh, to quite a fair extent, uh, it's, it's absolutely uh, normal. But perhaps also the fact that the Wilayat al-Faqih ideology has embedded in its, in its midst this um, clerical authority uh, can also help groups overcome uh, splits and disagreements. So in the 1990s, when Hezbollah had disagreements over whether or not to engage in parliamentary politics in Lebanon, and, and some leaders threatened to, to split, um, there was a fatwa by uh, Khamenei which uh, legitimized uh, the involvement in politics and, and eventually uh, uh, prevented uh, a major split from occurring. So perhaps sometimes this clerical authority, uh, this sort of hierarchy can help, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep these groups cohesive and uh, enduring over long periods of time as well. So this, this has been terrific. And you know, when people register for the webinar, they can ask a question at that time. And one of the questions that somebody submitted that uh, I did not ask was very bluntly, why is the Iranian revolution relevant 42 years later? Kind of why do we need to study the initial uh, spread of the revolution and, and 
outside of Iran. And I didn't ask the question, but all of you have done a tremendous job answering that question, providing very compelling answers to that question over the past uh, 90 minutes. So uh, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to please join me in thanking our panelists for a, a very exciting session. And I wish all of you a happy holidays. Our next Crown Seminar is February 2nd with uh, Aran Keshavarzian of NYU, who's going to discuss his ongoing research on processes of late imperialism and capital accumulation in the Persian Gulf. Uh, Aran speaking to the big question of to what extent and in what ways has the Persian Gulf been a unitary space uh, in modern times? And so it's part of a new uh, book project, I think. So uh, again, please join me in thanking our speakers. and. Uh, I hope to see all of you here at the Crown Center in person in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation, David. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.